drunk Roger Lauren and sequence number seven who wants to end the Drunk Roger Lauren and sequence number seven who wants to see and to the
Good evening, everyone. I am very, very excited to host tonight's Sci Art uh, Extravaganza here from Sudbury, Ontario. So if you joined us just a few minutes earlier, you would have heard an amazing piece of music that was called Genetic Corruption, the Power of the RNA Virus. And this was um, created by a Kyle Verhoeven. It was this piece that was submitted for the LUL Sci Art. So thank you so much, Kyle, for sharing that piece with us because it, uh, it, it really made a wonderful opening for this evening. So I wanna welcome everybody here for this special evening that's showcasing both art and science and poetry, which is a wonderful combination. Um, tonight, of course, we're broadcasting from Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. And to begin tonight, we acknowledge the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and to know that we are all treaty people. Science North and Laurentian University are located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, of the Chikamikshing Anishinaabek. And in the greater city of Sudbury, of course, this also includes the traditional lands of the Wanapate First Nation. So I wanna welcome everybody here on behalf of Science North. Um, we're really happy to be able to host tonight's event. My name is Amy Henson. I'm a scientist at Science North. And tonight, for the most part, I'm kind of working behind the scenes tonight, making all the technical things happen for tonight's event. Um, but there will be lots of amazing stuff going on. We have a wonderful lineup of poets that are gonna come on to read. We're gonna take a look at some of the amazing art pieces that we uh, have had submitted. Um, so one of the really interesting things though, if you would like, of course we have our comment section, which I think is over here. Yes, this way, over here. So if you wanna put your, uh, your comments in the comment section, please do. We really, really love to hear from you. Perhaps after a poet speaks, you wanna offer them congratulations. They would love to hear it, whether it's words of encouragement, or even we'd really love to hear your thoughts on some of the poet, um, some of the poems that are being read tonight. Um, I know we'd love to have a great discussion going in our chat. So please feel free to put comments in there. And, uh, and we'll also um, be putting in uh, some uh, links into our comments as well to where you can purchase some of the books from some of our poets and links to our Instagram account, um, the Sire Instagram account as well. So you can take a look at some of the things that are going to pop up in that chat. So, um, so we're very, very excited tonight. I want to introduce your host for this evening who will take you through all of this poetry. We have Dr. Thomas Merritt. He's a Canada Research Chair at Laurentian University. And uh, and Thomas, I'm very excited to have you. We'll later meet Amanda Durkin. She is a very accomplished artist in her own right, um, but she's also a PhD candidate at Laurentian University and she'll be giving away some of the Sci Art Awards for this evening. So you'll see Amanda a little bit later on, but the two of them together have led the development of this Sci Art event and usually, we hold it in person, but unfortunately, of course, with the events that we have going on in our world, we have to host it on the line tonight. But I'm gonna leave you in Thomas's very capable hands uh, while I work behind the scenes. And so Thomas, go ahead and take it away. You will need to unmute yourself. That was really close. I just about started speaking with the mute on. So that's awesome. Thanks, Amy. Um, and welcome everybody to my classroom. Uh, so I'm a professor at Laurentian University. Uh, we are teaching online and so you are in my basement classroom. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the ninth SciArt show. Um, I don't know when I uh, started the show in 2011 if I really thought it was gonna go this far. Um, it has been a fantastic nine years. I think you're gonna be really uh, impressed with the poetry and the science art that we have to showcase this evening. Um, this is the fourth year of partnership with Science North, which is just awesome. And we've got this fantastic format to to join, uh, to have you join us this evening. Um, it's also the third year of the Science Poetry Contest. And this contest is really something that, that has grown out of the show itself. And Kim Fawner has been an enormous part of, of making sure this show happens, the, the poetry half of the show happens for the last uh, three years. So thank you for to Kim and thank you all for joining us. Um, just I'll give you a brief overview of what the agenda is going to be for this evening. You're stuck with me, unfortunately, um, and I'm really terrible at this. So I will be reading my notes and reading them poorly. So you'll have to forgive me. Um, we're going to have readings from our local poets. So we have, uh, he says, counting four 
local poets uh, that we're going to hear from in just a minute. Uh, and then we're going to hear from our featured poet, Alice Major, who's been nice enough to join us from Alberta this evening. Uh, and I think we're all looking forward to all of those poems. Um, we're then going to take a break. And so we're going to take a look at the science art show. So we've had this show in person. As I said, this would have been the ninth year. Um, we're entirely online and we'll put the link uh, up in the comments section at one point at some point, but we have we have an Instagram page for the show. Um, and so over the next week or so, we'll be showcasing all the pieces there. At the end of this evening, we'll actually scroll through all the pieces. So if you want to hang on and wait with us, uh, we've got Kyle's music again, and we'll go through all 70 pieces of work that were submitted. Um, but in the middle of the show, Amanda's gonna, going to introduce the winners for this year's show. Okay, so let's go to poetry. And so this is also the second year that we have this amazing cross-disciplinary collaboration with Sulphur. Um, and a huge thank you goes out to Laurentian, to Sulphur, and the faculty that are involved with that. Um, the English department there has been really amazing in bringing us into their fold and, and highlighting the work last year and again this year. Uh, and our thanks go to Dr. Sylvia Hunt, Dr. Ernst Gerhardt, uh, and their editor, Carly K. McDonald, for in, uh, including us in that work. Um, if you're interested, I think we still have copies of the past of this past year's sulfur that are available at the Bay. Uh, and thanks again to Ken Fauna for her support of the poetry event, making this happen. And this year in particular to Nancy Doust, uh, who's taken the lead on making sure this competition is successful, has brought in all the poets, has organized the judges, and a huge thank you to Chloe La, De La Duchesse. Uh, and Brett Buchanan, who are our, our, three budget, our three judges with Nancy who made that happen. All right, we're going to go into the community uh, readings now. Our first poet is Benamra Padel, and he's going to read us his poem, Les Oiseaux. I want to give you a brief bio of uh, Benamra first. So he's in grade two, goes to R.L. Beatty, uh, as does my daughter. It's a wonderful school. His hobbies include uh, playing soccer, playing on the piano. Uh, he loves learning new things. He loves learning about planets and geography. He likes to talk about countries, flags, and capital cities, as well as the periodic table. He also enjoys playing video games with his older brother. And as I think we're going to see this evening, he really likes birds. So Ben Amra, if you could read for us, that would be lovely. <laughs> Il y a beaucoup d'animaux, mais je préfère les oiseaux. J'aime les oiseaux pour beaucoup de raisons. Les grenouilles peuvent sauter, mais les oiseaux peuvent voler. Les oiseaux est très beau parce que ils mangent de la hormo. Les oiseaux mangent les vers, mais les oiseaux ne mangent pas les pères. Les oiseaux prennent les œufs, mais un autre animal qui ne fait pas ça est le bœuf. Il y a des oiseaux multicolores. Dans le forêt tropical ce soir, le maman oiseau construit un nid. Pour les bébés oiseaux, le nid est paradis. Et ce c'est pourquoi j'aime les oiseaux. Merci. But Ebra, that was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. That was really, really wonderful. Uh, I, are you really in grade two? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't believe you, but I'll take your word for it. That's really lovely. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna go on to our second poet. Um, our second poet is the elementary school winner, Hannah Rose Gibson, and she's gonna read us her poem, Mirage in the Desert. Let me read you a little bit of a bio of Hannah. So Hannah is a grade 11 student at Marymount Academy who is recently uh, inspired by poetry. She credits her English teacher, Ms. Kim Fawner, for this newfound interest. Hannah loves to read, write, and sketch in her spare time. Unsurprisingly, her favorite subjects are English and art. However, while math is not something Hannah will ever find joy doing, she also has a love for science. She often finds her mind wandering, thinking about atoms and matter, the universe and planets, lights and sound, etc. As a part of the Sci Art Contest, her English class recently had the opportunity to meet the talented Canadian poet Alice Major. 
Through Alice's poetry, Hannah heard her own artistic perspective on science reflected back to her and was further inspired by how beautiful and expressive poetry could be. Her poem for this contest explores, this contest explores the science of a mirage written from the perspective of a person desperate for water in the relentless heat of the desert. And Hannah, I hope you will rethink your, your uh, dislike of math uh, and continue to per, per, pursue poetry and read us your piece on Mirage, please. Thank you. All right, my poem is called Mirage in the Desert. The smothering wind blows sand into my face, my chapped lips, my blinking eyes, my stinging cheeks, alone surrounded by dancing dunes of gold my only company, slithering, shimmering snakes of light. A wave of heat and nausea, the dancing dunes begin spinning and twirling around me, my knees, my side, my arm, my face, burning as they hit the hard, hot sand. Mere meters away from my face, a small puddle of water. It's there, I can see it. I just have to get there, struggling, shaking, Gasping, I drag myself closer, but the water seems to drain away. Slipping further out of reach, it evaporates. It's not there, I can't see it. Another puddle taunts me. Come here, little puddle, I croak. The puddle fades away. An optical illusion, a refraction of light, a distortion in the atmosphere, a hallucination caused by alternate layers of temperature, a false hope, a trick of nature. A mirage in the desert. Thank you. Hannah, thank you. That was really fantastic. I think you've made your teacher very proud. I, I can read between the lines. I think Kim is somewhere in her apartment or in her house crying right now. That was really fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Our next poet is our post-secondary winner, Michaela Buffard, and she's going to read the poem, Historical Changes of State. Uh, let me read you a little bit of a bio for Michaela. So Michaela Buffard is a third year student at Laurentian University studying biomedical biology. She's also the undergraduate representative in the biology uh, in the Department of Biology. Writing poems has been a passion of hers for many years and science themed poetry is a perfect combination of her interests. I'm excited to hear her poem on the states of matter. Thank you for being here, Michaela. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. We are stardust. We have carbon in our bones, salt in our veins, and iron in our blood. We are combustible. We inherit a little bit of fire from every intergalactic explosion that built us. We are derived from and return to the universe as a product of changing states. We are a force of nature. Sometimes we are booming crashes of electrical energy, and sometimes we just let it rain. We are biological specimens with chemical connections blindly following the laws of physics. Thank you. Michaela, thank you. I think you've done Laurentian very proud with that piece. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you. All right, our fourth and final community poet, uh, or the poetry contest winner uh, is Melanie Mart Martilla. Sorry, Melanie, I completely host your last name. Um, and let me read you um, a bio of, uh, uh, from Melanie before we ask her to, to read her piece. So Melanie has been writing since 1977 and her poetry and short fiction have been published in small press anthologies and in magazines such as Bastion Science Fiction, which I have to tell you, as I read this the first six times, I thought it was Boston. So it's only now that I've realized that it's Bastion Science Fiction, On Spec, Polar Borealis, and Stellar Evolutions. She received her Master's of English Literature and Creative Writing in 1999 and is a professional member of the Canadian Authors Association and SF Canada. When she's not writing, she works as an instructional designer. She lives with her spouse and fur baby in Sudbury, Ontario, on the street that bears her family name, and in the house where three generations of her family has lived. She's going to read us tonight her poem on Snow Lab, a space that is near and dear to my heart since I do research there. Melanie, thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Um, yes, so my poem, Encoded, was inspired by Snow Lab. Deep in Creighton, neutrinos reveal secrets. Most abundant particles, yet least massive, elusive, slip through everything. We must be gentle, careful. 
their mirror selves, anti-neutrinos, even harder to find, may rewrite physics so that we will become adept at reading backwards and upside down. Shed light on dark matter, transform a mine into a temple where great minds come to worship origins and futures and leptons dancing like Sufis, encoded. Thank you. Melanie, thank you. It's been too long since I've been in Snow Lab with the lockdown and that really makes me miss that space. Uh, that's a wonderful version of, of your vision of that space. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. All right. Thank you to all the winners for this year's poetry contest. And thank you to everybody who submitted poems. I think we had over 70, 70 poems this year, uh, which is really just amazing. It's wonderful to have that kind of community participation. We're now going to move on to our featured poet for this evening. So Alice Major is going to read for us. And I'm extremely excited to, to hear what Alice is going to, is going to present. Uh, let me read you a brief bio. So Alice Major is a past poet laureate of Edmonton, Alberta, as well as a past president of the League of Canadian Poets and the Writers Guild of Alberta. In her role as laureate in 2006, Alex, Alice founded the Edmonton Poetry Festival, which is now internationally renowned. Her latest book of poems is Welcome to the Anthropocene, and it's available through the University of Alberta Press. Uh, it was published in 2017, and we'll have a link for that up in the comments as well. She has written 11 books of poetry, two novels of young adults, for young adults, and an award-winning collection of essays about science and poetry, Intersecting Sets, A Poet Looks at Science. Alice, if you would please read for us. Thank you so much, Thomas. I hope, I, I'm, I hope you're hearing me. Um, it's delightful to be here. I'm very happy to join you from uh, Treaty 6 territory, where Aboriginal and Indigenous voices have been heard for 10,000 years and longer. Um, so I do want to share some poems that grow out of my own relationship to science. Um, it's been a lifelong interest. And I think scientists and poets are are doing in a sense some of the same things. We're, we're observers. We are trying to notice and, uh, uh, and make sense of the patterns that we see around us. And we're trying to communicate with others about those patterns. Now, all of us poets, scientists, whoever are trying to keep up with the latest developments um, and, uh, in technology and science, but I think what poets are trying to do is provide a sense of meaning, a, a perspective on these, um, these developments. So I'm going to start with some sections of a long poem called Welcome to the Anthropocene. Now, the Anthropocene, as many of you probably know, is the name that we're giving this period of Earth's history when humans have become a geological force, really. We're already moving more rocks and gravel than all the natural processes of erosion. Um, and we know that we're affecting the atmosphere and, of course, the oceans. So some people don't like the name Anthropocene. They think that anthro is just too self-centered of us. Because, of course, we're not here just by ourselves in this world. We're here because of we're here along with all the other creatures and fungus and, and uh, plants that have come through evolution with us. Anyway, I started writing this poem based on a, an article that I'd found uh, about the uh, Museum of Post-Natural History, which is a small institution in Pittsburgh. And it's um, an interesting uh, one because it focuses on all the organisms that human beings have intentionally uh, altered through our history. And it was going to be just an ordinary short poem. And then a motor started and it just kept going. And I was, I found myself calling on all the sciences I find so interesting um, biology and cognitive evolution and neuroscience and, and, um, and of course, geology and cosmology. So I wanted, I found I wanted to welcome everything to this moment in time that we share on this planet. 
So the first section I'm going to read starts with a little couplet by the English poet Alexander Pope, um, who wrote, From nature's chain, whatever link you strike, tenth or ten thousandth breaks the chain alike. Welcome. Welcome to the Anthropocene raccoon, coyote, house mouse, peregrine, squirrel, red fox, ratus norvegicus, all you creatures who can live with us, being sufficiently plastic to adapt and thrive upon our handouts, urban crap, suburban rubbish dumps and garbage cans. A welcome Canada goose taking your stand, all five million of you on our parks and golf courses, you avian oligarchs hissing at our dogs, dropping gray-green turds on swaths of grass. You're what we've deserved after we've homogenized the landscape planet-wide. Our broad foot eradicates the little islands of ecology, the disappearing rare, the melody of the threatened, red-eyed vireos, piping plovers, grasshopper sparrows, all the small, sweet, uncompetitive. Immured in cities, we forget we live on a planet that is more inventive than ourselves. Her secrets are undreamt of even now. Her hidden leaves and worms, her microbes, her amphibians. And yet we churn her soils, her ocean depths, her streams, like the thwacking paddles of a dough machine. And worldwide our cities rise as uniform as mass-produced white bread. We transform the richly variegated species it, we transform the richly variegated niches into starved soil for weedy species like ourselves, mown, shorn vegetation. Chronically impoverished, yet unchastened, we think the gadgetry we've gained redeems our losses. Why should we miss one small, green, leaf-shaped frog, gone from a distant tropic half a world away? We are too myopic to see this slender loss might mean a space is closed, a possibility effaced. And the second part I'd like to read from this long poem, um, I just want to note, one of the things that fascinates me is how sometimes our myths end up echoing in a way the models that science brings forward. And this one will reference um, uh, a Buddhist uh, legend of the net of Indra. Now, welcome to the Anthropocene, you battered, tilting globe. Still, you gleam a blue pearl on the necklace of the planets. This home. Clouds, oceans, life forms span it from pole to pole within a peel of air as thin as lace lapped round an apple. Fair and fragile bounded sphere, yet strangely tough. This world that life could never love enough. And yet its loving care has been entrusted to a feckless species more invested in the partial while the total goes unnoticed. Our inconvenient hearts, so focused on what is near, the pet dog's suffering but not the world's, our attention sputtering like fading flashlights. Meanwhile, leaders wave lightsabers wildly as they try to carve our common interests into fragments. Our coherent will to act turns stagnant. Our batteries go flat and we cannot see beyond the dark in our vicinity. Dear planet, 
we might find illumination in you and lessons in a murmuration of starlings, shape-shifting veil of wings in evening air. Its flow of change begins not with a leader striking out a path towards a goal, dragging along a swath of followers, but from a turning in, guidance not from center, but from rim. A few birds at the edge respond to danger, plunge a predator, and the remainder reorient to synchronize their flight as quickly as particles of magnetite shift in a magnetic field, as fast as thought goes rippling through synapses that don't quite touch. Then think how everything does touch. Our universe comes blossoming out of a vacuum that is not void, but plenum, boiling substrate, being, void by its own unceasing, fizzing, spin and spit. Tension, potential, a tinkerer's kit of fields and forces and virtual bosons joined into a charged dimension where every point is a world defined by multiple descriptors, gluon field and gravity, the raptures of light and magnetism intertwined, attraction, repulsion, balanced and combined. And from, okay, sorry. <laughs> Indra's net hangs above the peaks of his holy mountain, the shining pleat of a tent of stars draped above the world, where every knot is fastened with a pearl, and every separate jewel in the mesh reflects every other gem at every vertex. Mere myth, perhaps, but let us consider Earth as one such gem. Cerulean mirror gleaming from this corner of the dark galactic lattice, alone we think, apart. And yet a world reflecting millions of such worlds, limitless grid of brilliance that, like the studded crystalline arrays of an insect's compound eye, surveys the whole in parts. Indra's gift to us, to see in one small pearl, the gemmed immensity. So that is welcome to the Anthropocene. Um, I'd like to sort of change to another book called Standard Candles and read a couple of poems from it. Um, you know, one of the things about being aware of the limited quality of the, the planet, that we have to be careful of it and, and gardeners of it and housekeepers of it. But humans, are, we still crave the vast, the infinite, which is why I think I'm drawn so much to cosmology, the science of the birth and the nature and the eventual evolution and perhaps death of the universe. So, of course, people have always been uh, drawn to the vastness of the skies, but, you know, for the ancients, these were the fixed stars. Um, they, they rotated around the earth and, and they were orderly. But about, and up to about maybe 100 years ago, we thought the Milky Way might be the whole thing. Absolutely uh, nothing else outside our one galaxy. Though astronomers with their first telescopes were thinking that there were some faint smudges and could they be maybe island universes? I am staggered to think how much we have learned in a century. Now we are able to measure how far away those smudges are and to know that they are island universes and that they go on galaxy after galaxy after supercluster. And one of the main tools that we have to do that is a standard candle, 
that helps us measure distances at the cosmic scale. Now, it's a simple concept, although it's very complicated to actually uh, work out, but say you've got two 100 watt bulbs and you know that like they're exactly the same uh, energy give output, but one looks fainter. And that's maybe because that one is further away from you. Now, the potential, this becomes a tool, a very important one. And the potential for it was first noticed by a modest astronomer called Henrietta Swan Levitt. And she was working at the Harvard Observatory. Clouds of Glory, 1908. Miss Levitt, lace wasted, hair knotted neatly at her neck's nape, pours over photographic plates. In the observatory's panelled, gas lit room, Henrietta exercises her gift for the meticulous. These slabs of glass have caught the light of constellations from the high skies of the Andes. The Magellanic clouds, those flags of glowing gauze that guided mariners across the unknown southern oceans. Magellan, Tasman, Cook, and long before then, those ancient wanderers whose canoes and skillful rafts reached archipelagos and islands and scattered necklaces of coral. The telescope's glass eye resolves those clouds of glory into a starry net, an island universe adrift beyond our own Milky Way. And there, as here, some stars flash out like sweeping beams of lighthouse beacons, now bright, then dim. Miss Levitt goes exploring with her tools of navigation, her blink comparator, mathematics, graphs, to demonstrate a simple, stunning truth. The brighter it is, the slower it blinks. She is holding up a standard candle. Now telescopes can search still smaller, fainter clouds that smudge the fathomless, unmapped heavens. And on those further islands find still other lighthouse stars to calculate how far away they are. For all of us to realize, amazed, how very far from us those islands lie. Looking Out to the Dark, December 1928. Miss Levitt, measuring the magnitude of stars. Your grave weeps with funeral wreaths, petals frozen to pale transparency. The mourners have now gone. There will be only your name etched on a granite stone in block letters, along with the small bones of a baby brother, baby sister you hardly knew. There will be your tiny, careful lettering in the ledger where you noted stars, their exact positions, minute gradations of light. Later, there will be a lunar crater named for you. But though you had a nature full of sunshine, we will choose a bashed basin on the dark side of the moon. This is all we now retain of you, a name, a few scraps of obituary, an early death, the numbers on the blue ruled pages that you recorded faithfully. Faithful. Henrietta, daughter, 
and descendant of the clergy, sincere in your attachment to religion and your church, did it worry you? This great lurch outward, your discovery, we are a single blinking island on a swelling sea. Were you lost on that dark ocean? Or no, you loved your glowing clouds. And I will read just one last short poem. Um, one of my favorite models for uh, the unfolding of the end and end of the universe uh, is sometimes called brain theory. Basically, the idea is that our uh, universe is riding along the mem uh, on, on a large multidimensional membrane and that there's another membrane out there and that they're drifting apart and then they are going to come together again. And when they do, that starts the Big Bang all over. So this is for both poets and cosmologists. The Muse of Universes. Once in a trillion years, the Muse of Universes claps her hands and with that shock of light reverses an eon of drift dilution, the outward rolling wave of dark, and the illusion of end times. A new draft she orders, and the universe erupts into rhyme, fields and forces echoing. She rebuts formlessness, sparks stanzas from an alphabet of particles, spells out what matters, what radiates, what tickles the fancy into galaxies with gravity's feather pen. She unrolls the scroll of space, says, there, now start again. Thank you, everyone. And congratulations to um, all of the people at uh, Laurentian University that has made this extraordinary collaboration possible. Uh, Alice, thank you. I, I'm pretty speechless. That was amazing. The the power in your reading is is wonderful and infectious. And thank you so much for for being part of the event tonight. That was really lovely. I need to take a break. Um, I that was just wonderful. We're gonna we're gonna transition now, and we're gonna talk about the the science art half of the science art and poetry show. Uh, and so Amanda Durkin is going to take over and lead us through the winners for this year. Um, before she does that, I want to tell you that the only reason we have a show this year is because of Amanda. Um, so we've had a wonderful partnership with the science communication program for the last, I think, five years. We've had an intern um, that has made this show possible through an incredible amount of work to, to get all the logistics together and get it organized. Uh, and with changes at the university, that wasn't possible this year. Uh, Amanda has been volunteering with us for a couple of years and she really stepped up this year. Um, and we are here because of her hard work, organizing everybody, getting everything together and her amazing artwork that graced us with all the posters. So the announcement for today and for the show itself has been thanks to Amanda. Uh, so Amanda, thank you for being here. You are amazing and you are the reason that we're here. <laughs> thank you. Tell us about the Sci Art Show. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Amanda Durkin and I'm a local PhD candidate at Health Sciences North Research Institute and I perform immunology-based research. I am also a science artist um, and I draw anatomy-based art and I sell my work through my small business called Amandatomical Art. So the LUL Sci Art Show is one of my favorite events every year and I'm very happy this year to be helping with the organization and running of the event. The LUL Sci Art Show challenges students, artists, and researchers alike to examine their work from new perspectives. Researchers are asked to express their ideas using artistic media and artists are challenged to use their medium to represent scientific concepts. So we aim to feature piece, pieces that show the connection between all fields of research and art. So this year we have five categories, uh, the Greater Sudbury community members, LUL students, uh, staff and faculty, and then elementary students and secondary students. So we're gonna jump right in and start off with the Greater Sudbury community members section. Um, and since there is nobody here with me, if everyone wants to do a little drum roll, I'm going to announce the winner first. So the winner for this category 
is Amanda Perry uh, with her piece called Body Positivity. So this is an acrylic painting showing the decomposition of a lone sheep and all of the insects that will feed off of it. It's a beautiful showcase um, of death and decomposition. Uh, the judges really loved this piece. It was really well done. Um, and you can kind of stare at it forever because there are so many small intricate details. In this section, we also have two honorable mentions. Uh, one to Amy Lismayer, uh, who created this piece called Amanita Muscaria. And it's a polymer clay and acrylic paint mushroom model inspired by models made in the Victorian and Edwardian era. And then another honorable mention to Adrienne Asinoue with her piece called Rhythm. And it's a fiber art piece representing the rhythm to life that we fail to note. The movement of sound, the flow of the wind, and the transition from life to death. This piece also showcases the anatomical cat skull, um, which you can see is placed on the outline. We also wanted to give a very special mention uh, to Hayden Butler. Uh, he submits beautiful stained glass panels every year and asks to not be considered in the competition for prizes. Uh, his work is phenomenal, and in person, the stained glass panels are more amazing than ever. Um, so we appreciate your submissions, and we love the scientists that you feature in your work each year. So these are his two submissions for this year. So Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, and then Freeman Dyson at 98. So thank you, Hayden, um, for continuing to participate in our show. The next category is LUL students. So again, a little drum roll for this winner. Um, so the, for the winner of this category, it is Kyle Verhonen. Um, so he created that electronic piece that you may have heard if you were here at the beginning called Genetic Corruption, The Power of the RNA Virus. And it's an electronic music piece made to envision the process of RNA transcription, which continues until the point of viral contact. Um, and here we're just gonna play a little snippet of it, um, but the full version will be played at the end of the show when we go through all of the submissions. Such a unique piece. And then we have two honorable mentions for the LUL category. Um, the first one to Samuel Levac with his piece, uh, What is DNA? Uh, so he created a book folding piece to demonstrate the importance of DNA in carrying all of the genetic information for development, functioning, and growth. And the DNA is the story of who you are, um, which is shown here within um, this book that he created. And then we have Tegan Neufeld with her piece, This Is Your Brain on Paper. So she created a brain demonstrating all of the different Broadman areas using layered paper. So Broadman areas are based on the types of neurons and connections that are found within that part of the brain. So both of these pieces were really amazing. Uh, thank you for your submissions. Oops. And the next category is LUL staff and faculty. So this includes um, staff and faculty at Laurentian, but also uh, Snow Lab faculty and staff. Um, so again, a little drum roll. The winner of this category uh, is Blair Flynn uh, with her piece called Traces. So these are long exposure pinhole photographs um, that show the traces of the sun's path across the sky each day. So over time, you can actually see very small changes. Um, so this specifically was taken um, for about two months in a south facing location. Um, and they're very neat because you can see the sun's path. Um, and we were, just, the judges were blown away uh, with this piece. So thank you, Blair. And then we have honorable mentions. Um, so the first one is to Elizabeth Wanghover for her pieces, Zatina and Zenit. So these paintings are created by layering colors of acrylic paint mixed with silicone and then poured in a circular motion onto a canvas. Uh, the technique was discovered by a Mexican painter, but the beautiful patterns are created by science, specifically the fluid mechanics of hydrodynamic instability. And then an honorable mention for Mary Martinez Garcia, um, a pr professor that I know very well, and she created yarn in different ways. So she um, creates these cute creatures that are created by crocheting and, and felting. 
Um, she has the musk osk at the top here, a hummingbird, um, and an aardvark. Thank you for those submissions and congratulations. Now we're gonna jump into the elementary student category. Um, so the winner for this category, drumroll, is Elizabeth Caruso with her piece called Color Races. Um, so these are made by putting color at the bottom of paper and then allowing the colors to be picked up and carried through the paper. Different pigments will move through at different speeds and some will travel and then some will stop along the way. So this is a very creative piece and it's very beautiful. And then we have our honorable mentions. Um, so we have two of them here. We have coronavirus painting by Rhea Vankadison. Um, and these are both uh, short little videos. So first I'm gonna show uh, Rhea's video and she's in JK at RLPD. What's your name? Rhea. What grade are you in? JK. What school do you go? RLPD. Okay, what do you have in your hand? What do you wanna tell us? This. This is coronavirus. This is injection. Mm -hmm. Stay home. Help me go to school. So that's Rhea's piece. It's very, very cute and informative. Um, and then we have Tania Van Kedessen with uh, Let Us Defeat COVID-19 Together. Um, again, a short little video. Hi, my name is Tanya. I'm in fourth grade at RLB. And this is my project for science arts. This is coronavirus. This is the variant of coronavirus. These are antibodies. Um, this is sanitizer and COVID-19 vaccine. If we put, wear masks, stay in two meters distance, wash our hands, and take the vaccine, we'll be able to defeat this coronavirus. Another very informative video. Thank you guys, Rhea and Tania. Those are amazing. So then we're gonna to go to our last category, which is secondary students. Um, we had a lot of submissions from um, Allison's, Allison Wood's class. They were all very amazing, um, but we still had to choose a winner. Um, so drum roll, uh, the winner for this category is Haley Sizamaniac with her piece called The Center of Our Lives. So this piece shows the pulmonary system demonstrating its importance in the body. The bones represent the ribs with the lungs underneath. And then the heart shape is seen encompassing the system. This piece shows the system within the body that allows us to continue living the way we do. Um, the judges were really impressed with this piece. It's beautiful um, and very well done. So congratulations, Haley. And then we have two honorable mentions. Um, first, we have Madison Hallett with the Black Dahlia, and this is made with black ink. This piece demonstrates the importance of forensics in helping to identify victims, allowing for closure for affected families. And then we have Quinn Charlesley with Grand Jeté, um, and he made a sculpture with tinfoil and polymer clay showing a male ballet dancer and the muscles that are involved in this very powerful jump. So congratulations um, to all the secondary students and thank you for all your submissions. Um, so that's the end of the winners and the honorable mentions. I wanted to thank everyone who submitted this year and congratulations to our winners and the honorable mentions. We encourage you all to submit to our show next year, which will hopefully be hosted in person. Uh, the submissions of the art this year were truly amazing and they really just make us so happy to see the community, students and researchers creating pieces that show the interconnectedness of science and art. So thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you for, for leading us through that. I, I have an assistant now, so my daughter is standing behind me. Whoop! And you can only see the top of her head. Um, and so let me just echo my daughter's words and say those pieces of work were just amazing. So thank you to all the artists. Uh, congratulate the winner and thank you to everybody that submitted pieces. We're, we're going to have all of the pieces on a slideshow uh, at the end of today. All right, the last piece for tonight uh, will be readings from three of our local poets. And I'm really excited that we have all three of these poets here with us. Uh, we're gonna, so our, our featured local poets are, uh, we're gonna start with Vera Constantinau. Oh, Vera, I am really sorry. I'm sure I could have done a better job with that last name if I had tried a little bit harder. I really did practice. 
Um, let me read you a, a brief biography from Vera. So Vera writes haiku and verse poetry, short fiction and creative nonfiction. She's a member and past president of the Sudbury's Writers Guild, a member of Haiku Canada and the Canada, Canadian Authors Association. Vera's work has been published internationally. In March of 2020, we were lucky enough to have Vera appointed Poet Laureate of the city, city of Greater Sudbury. Vera, I'm looking forward to hearing you read. Thank you, Thomas. I am happy to be Poet Laureate, and I am Vera Constantino. <laughs> I, uh, when I knew I was going to read here, I got very excited about writing Buttergate poetry haiku, and uh, then it got boring. But I do have two pieces of butter-related poetry, because if you don't know about Buttergate, it's uh, farmers using pa uh, palmitic acid to bump up the butter fat in cow's milk so that all the pandemic bakers we've sprouted during this year can make more baking. On the counter, a dish of butter holds sperm. Lockdown, bakers fatten the herd one bite at a time. If you don't know what that refers to, it's the uh, saturated fat increase that is from the palm oil. Always bad for everyone. <laughs> I, I decided that I would lighten things up a little bit with my uh, writing and, and read you two haibun, which is a Japanese literature genre that has a prose piece and haiku inserted in it or following it. Uh, you can see where the science comes in when I read them. Science. My first conscious experiment carries a lot of coincidentals. I'm five. I've been given a box of rejected treasures that includes a wind-up clock, which I get to keep. My brother, always in the market for a deal, offers me a dime for the round-faced timepiece. I say yes. He gives me a dime and heads off with his friends. I walk to the store for a small bag of candy and sit under the willow tree in the yard to enjoy what I've chosen. When the candy bag is empty, I go back inside. Clock face caught in a sunbeam, idle hands. There on the table sits the clock, beside a basin of water which my mother, interrupted by a call, is using to wipe down shelves. The question, will a clock tick under water, comes to me from nowhere. Question, meet opportunity. The answer is no. Once a clock has been fully submerged, the ticking will stop. When my brother gets home, his clock is still on the table, somewhat heavier being waterlogged as it is. He wants his dime back, but it's way too late for that. He rants, tells mother what I've done. All she says is, oh, well, you ought to have put it away. And with that, she exits the kitchen. From the hall, the sound of muffled laughter. Friday a new clock. My second height bun is learning curve. Sixes and sevens should never be left alone in a front yard where the push mower with its sharp, shiny rotary blade has also been left carelessly abandoned. It draws us. We, my best friend and I, discuss we're going to experiment. She chooses hold the leaf. I am delegated to push the mower. Red petunias under noonday sun, more vivid now. Wedding day, the, the tip of her ring finger still missing. She's forgiven me. <laughs> I have forgiven myself. My final piece today is, or this evening, is In This World. On this round, spinning, dirt-filled eco-petri dish, humans are a singular moving part 
among many moving parts. That is life. DNA, when examined, can wound, can heal, can open doors and close doors. As we walk mountains and peat bogs, powdered limestone cliffs, and the near islands with strata lines going this way and that, each layer is rife with fossils of previously moving parts. Remember, in this world, we are a moment. Thank you. Vera, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we were really fortunate to have you as Poet Laureate in, in Sudbury. Um, but remind me not to do any experiments with you. I, I think I want to keep all of my fingers intact. You're safe. <laughs> Our next reading uh, this evening is going to be from Chloe La Duche. And Chloe is author of Furries. Her first collection of poetry was published uh, by Memoir de Écrire in, in, in 2017, which was nominated for a Trillium Book Award for Poetry. Over the last five years, Chloe has been published in magazines, collaborated in collective books, organized three editions of bilingual zine, uh, fair Exposine Sudbury, and taken part in numerous literary events. Chloe was the fifth Poet Laureate, uh, and I think was Poet Laureate when we did this last year. Uh, Poet Laureate of Sudbury, her tenure has brought to, no brought to notoriety through the infamous parking poem controversy. Her second poetry collection, Exoquelet, maybe, uh, will be published this May. Uh, and full disclosure, it contains no poem about parking. Chloe, thank you for joining us this evening. Merci, Thomas. I wrote that bio just so you could say these things about the parking poem controversy. So I'm glad you did. Um, so my name is Chloé La Duchesse. I'm going to be reading in French tonight about, it's a poem I wrote about whales. And it's been inspired by uh, the fact that we don't know why some whales jump. There's no scientific explanation yet. So I've read this poetic essay called Pourquoi le saut des baleines? And it it's poetic explanations of why they could be jumping. And one of them is simply because the weight of their life is too much, ocean is too much pressure, and they just want to escape their lives by jumping. And then when they fall back on the water, it's like a slap in the face and they wake up from their dreadful lives. And uh, with these times, with the COVID and everything, I kind of feel like a well. So I wrote a poem about it, and it's called Le Chant des Baleines. Ma mère dit que les baleines l'ont tenue éveillée toute la nuit. Elle est assise à la table à pique-nique, la tête tournée vers l'estuaire, parmi le silence des baleines qui se sont tues il y a plusieurs heures déjà. Elle dit qu'avant l'aube, elle a marché pieds nus dans l'herbe trempe pour aller les écouter, elle toute seule et puis les mammifères marins. Je ne la vois pas. Je dors dans la tente avec mon frère et ma sœur. Rien ne me réveille et pas même le chant des baleines. De toute façon, ces chants ne sont que pour elle, pour ma mère qui partage tout. Je l'imagine dans l'aube humide, debout, tournée vers l'eau. Elle retient les pans de sa veste contre son ventre. Ses pieds sont couverts de rosée froide. Elle attend, l'esprit en paix, seule, pas seule avec les baleines, pendant que nous dormons durs comme des pierres précieuses dans la tente de camping. Quand elle parle des baleines, ma mère ne nous regarde pas. Elle est encore dans ce lieu où la nuit nargue le jour, dans ce temps où le son guide les pas. Quelque chose s'attarde dans les gestes de ma mère qui range maintenant la vaisselle du déjeuner sans bruit. Bol de plastique, cornflakes, lait de vache. Hantée par l'aube, elle met dans tous ses gestes une joie tranquille. Les baleines sont venues la visiter. Elle nage encore dans ses yeux ce matin. Plus tard, nous descendons la falaise pour toucher à l'eau, ni douce ni piquante de Tadoussac, belle province. Je reste collé à la grève. Je nage mal et j'ai peur des algues. Les profondeurs me donnent le vertige. Il y a, au fond de l'eau, des animaux qui restent à nommer et qui risquent de toucher mes pieds si je passe trop proche d'eux. Mm -mm, non, c'est hors de question. L'eau à la teinte du métal. J'y perds mes dix orteils, mes tibias, mes genoux, quand j'ai de l'eau jusqu'à la taille, je vire de bord. Je reviens vers ma mère qui garde les yeux sur l'horizon au cas où les baleines reviendraient la saluer. 
Près de 30 ans ont passé et je continue de rêver à des cétacés de toutes sortes, des grandes bleues et des petites pygmées, des rorcales communs et des jubartes joyeuses. Les baleines sautent et on ne sait pas pourquoi. Certains disent qu'elles s'amusent et d'autres qu'elles s'ennuient. Elles s'élancent le plus haut possible pour mieux se réveiller de leur vide existentiel. Quand elles retombent, le choc est pareil à une grande claque sur la gueule. Les baleines bleues, les plus grands animaux de notre époque, sont si lourdes que si on les sortait de l'eau, elles s'affaisseraient sur elles-mêmes. C'est la pression de l'eau sur leur grande peau qui les tient en place, qui les tient en un seul morceau qui empêche les baleines de se retrouver recroquevillées au fond de leur lit, incapables de faire face à une autre journée sans bon sens, sans regarder devant et voir toujours la même affaire, des kilomètres cubes d'eau et toujours la même affaire, la répétition du même, le même, le même, on n'en peut plus du même. Tout est une question d'équilibre. Comment garder les deux pieds sur terre quand on nage tellement loin au-dessus du fond océanique? Règne animal Embranchement des cordées, sous-embranchement des vertébrés, super classe des tétrapodes, classe des mammifères. Dans une autre vie, ma mère était une baleine. Sa cage thoracique, une cathédrale sous-marine, ses poumons, deux montgolfières, son cœur lourd comme quatre fois moi. Moi, mon petit cœur peine à pomper sa joie, à réchauffer mes orteils mangés par la mer métallique. J'étouffe entre quatre murs qui ne sont pas ma peau, mais qui me démangent pareil. Je veux sortir de mon corps, connaître l'ivresse des grands vents du large, brève solitude aérienne. Je veux tout bête dans les vagues de l'enfant qui prend son élan et saute et éclabousse. Je veux jaillir hors de l'eau, jaillir hors de ma maison, échapper à l'hiver, suivre le Gulf Stream jusqu'en Europe, nager sur le dos, des étoiles plein les yeux, développer un évent, devenir un geyser, refaire ma vie sur une île tropicale, manger des cornflakes dans un bol en plastique et chanter, chanter vers 4 heures du matin, au cas où quelqu'un, quelque part, attendrait encore le sommeil. Et puis, je pense à ma mère, hors chant, qui écoute les baleines, je l'imagine, seule dans la brume, du petit matin, pas encore éclos. Je la vois, même si j'y suis pas. Je dors dur comme une pierre précieuse. Et ma mère, hantée par le fado des baleines, me demande. Et là, tu l'entends? Entre les vagues brisées sur la grève et le vent kaléidoscope, une baleine et ses trente tonnes d'angoisse existentielle chante. Je sais, c'est absurde. Espérer s'échapper comme ça en sautant hors de l'eau, s'échapper un instant, un tout petit instant d'ivresse pour oublier la répétition tautologique du même. Les baleines, les baleines cherchent peut-être la transcendance, et moi aussi. Ma mère dit que les baleines l'ont tenue éveillée toute la nuit. Elle est assise à la table à pique-nique. Elle est heureuse. Les baleines nagent dans ses yeux et elles chantent en préparant le déjeuner. Merci, c'était le chant des baleines. J'ai fini mon poème. Oh, I have to say it in English, I guess. Uh, so that was my poem about the whales and how, uh, how sometimes we feel we can be somewhere else and have the whole ocean. So that was my only poem. Merci, Chloe. My pleasure. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for reading that for us. Our last poet for this evening is Kim Fawner. Uh, and Kim, as I said, has been a big part of making this event happen. So I think a huge thank, thank you again to Kim for, for being here uh, and for really championing this, championing, championing this event for the last four years. Uh, Kim was the fourth poet laureate of Greater Sudbury and the first woman appointed to that role. Her latest book of poetry is These Wings, which was published by Peddler Press in 2019. Uh, and hopefully you've got a copy of that. I love mine. Uh, 
She is the Ontario representative for the Writers' Union of Canada. Kim recently won the League of Canadian Poets 2021 broadsheet contest for her poem, Beekeeping, uh, which was quite an honor and a recognition. And we're super fortunate to have Kim wrapping up the event this evening. Thank you, Kim, for being here and for reading. And you're still muted if that matters. Thanks. Um, okay. I thought I would read you three poems from my Galileo sequence. And this is to thank Alice, uh, mostly. I was lucky enough to hear her speak with Davis O'Bell, who wrote Galileo's Daughter, at um, Paul Pearson's launch in the fall online of his book, Lunatic Engine. So I've been drawn to Galileo for a while and I was trying to figure out why. I love the song that Ellis Paul does. Uh, if you don't know that, you should listen to it. And I love the Indigo Girls song. <laughs> so I often listen to them when I write these poems. Um, I was also, I fell in love with somebody in my late 20s who was a physicist. So um, he taught me a lot about constellations and astronomy and um, stars. And Galileo, of course, is in there too. So I'm going to read you three of these poems. The first one is called Conjecture Here Among Shadows. Um, he had trouble with his eyes because he was constantly looking up at the sky through telescopes. I kind of wove in the pandemic hygiene rules in here too. Don't look directly into the sun. His mother likely told him this even before Galileo found his eye drawn to the cool touch of telescope, glass pressing against long eyelashes, the seduction of the heavens too much for him to bear on a clear night with the moon as his lover. Wash your hands. Share an eyepiece and you'll end up with ocular infections running rampant. Soon, before you know it, you'll see a luminous halo spreading slowly around the flame of a candle. Disinfect your equipment. Don't mind your eyes and you'll risk losing sight of the skirt of a potential lover passing through the streets of Florence in a hurry. Blink too hard, too quickly, and you'll miss the placement of the planets the stars, and then those sunspots that you so long to map, to pin down with heliographic cartography. Find the sun's equator and follow their paths from there. Map them out. Search for logic amidst magic. Blink once, then twice. Soon enough, everything disappears. Um, so the second poem, there are many, some are still unwritten. The second poem is written in couplets and it's, um, he was having a conversation with a fellow astronomer in um, Europe whose name was Welser. And so I took the title of this from a letter that he wrote and the title is called The Difficulty of This Matter. They were trying to sort out how sunspots worked. Uh, this is in 1612, he spent most of the spring and summer mapping them. And there are wonderful photographs of his drawings online. Um, it was published in 1613. And of course, then there's the Inquisition and that causes chaos for him. But he does all right, really. <laughs> so this is called The Difficulty of This Matter. Let the telescope invert the image of the sun and its spots then. And trace it on paper that spreads itself across your busy desk. Look at it head on, the sun, with eyes wide open, and you will ruin your eyes over and over. Don't. Keep them for later so you can look up again and know that the sun will be your mistress until you go. Trace those sunspots, how they travel for a month of days, so that you leave behind a penciled map for astronomers. More like terrestrial clouds than stars, you tell Welser in a letter more like emotions that move through a body than satellites that orbit it. Let them be vapors or exhalations then, or clouds or fumes sent out from the sun's globe. Or let them be blown kisses sent on the backs of fierce atmospheric windstorms. And then my last piece is a bit different. Um, I wrote it about his daughter, whose name was Virginia. She was born in 1600, but she became a nun. A lot of the Italian uh, families would put their daughters in nunneries in the convents. 
Um, and he had a very strange, close relationship with her, nothing untoward, so you needn't worry. Um, but she took good care of him and she used to rewrite his letters. And I kept thinking, as a feminist, I always think um, of using our voices. We're so often spoken over and told to be quiet and shushed and you're too loud or you can't say that. And it takes forever to speak your voice and mind. So I wanted to do this for her. And so this poem is called This Father's Daughter from Maria Celeste. Um, I wondered what she would have been like if she had not become a nun, you know? What was underneath all of that surface? A lot of passion, I think, for her art. His mind, so sharp, his eyes, so worn, and his hand trembling with a quake that stopped him from forming letters in the way he once did when he was young and beautiful. She loved him so much, that girl, that she swept up the first letter of every paragraph, all glorious, gorgeous, and triumphant, made it more than it was meant to be, fancied it up with loops and tails and flourishes, switching her pen back and forth like a wand, dancing starry-eyed through the cobalt velvet of a midnight Florentine sky. His mind, so sharp, his eyes so worn, and his hand so shaken, fashioned words that were small, crippled, and climbing on a slant, steeply either up or down the page. She loved him so much, that girl of his, that she bent all the lowercase d's back over themselves so that they danced sensual tangos. And then she swept a silk ribbon of ink high up and far, far above to give them privacy in illuminated text, a sentence so seductive as the taste of mango eaten slowly in an early morning bed. So that is for Virginia or Maria Celeste. I just also really wanted to take a moment to thank everyone at Science North and Laurentian University because I know especially the people at Laurentian are going through a difficult time. And I wanna thank the English department for sulfur, but also for having given me uh, my start in literature. I wouldn't be the poet and writer I am today without that department. And so I'm thankful for them. Um, and I am hopeful for what comes next. Um, the arts are so important and the weaving of art and science is so important too. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. I think those are, those are great words to for us to finish up on. Uh, the point of having this show is to bring science and art together. Uh, and I think that, that all of our poets this evening and, and the artwork that we've seen earlier today uh, are really wonderful examples of, of what we can do uh, when the when we cross across the when we move across those boundaries uh, and explore what art can tell us about science and maybe what science can tell us about art. That pretty much wraps up our evening. I'm looking at my notes and I think we're done. Um, we're going to to go to now uh, a scrolling of all of the the pieces from the show. Um, so we had 70 works of art. We're going to scroll through each of them now, and we're going to use Kyle's music as a background. Amy, I think you have a final goodbye as we lead into that uh, slideshow. Absolutely. I just want to thank all of our poets and congratulate all of the amazing submissions that we had for Sci Art this 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 kind of time round. I am I'm I'm very sad that we couldn't do this in person. We usually host this event at both Laurentian University and Science North, but I'm very glad that and grateful that we do have this online ability to connect and still celebrate art and poetry and science all together in our community. And I look forward to hoping to be able to do this in person uh, next year for sure. So as we said, um, we will just finish off by playing a slideshow. The broadcast will end after the slideshow, but um, this broadcast will stay on the Science North YouTube channel. So if you'd like to watch it again, please feel free to go visit uh, after we're finished tonight. Also, you can go ahead, share it with family and friends. We really would love um, for many people to see this later on. Um, and of course, as we showcase this art, if you're watching it post-broadcast, just feel free to press pause and really look um, deeply at some of the artwork. Unfortunately, we have to scroll through them fairly, fairly quickly, but we wanna make sure that you can fully appreciate all the beautiful pieces. So. Thank you very much. We're very happy to host this. Thank you, uh, Thomas. And uh, I can't wait to do this again next year.